This episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org. SpaceX Starship Updates and Starship for Moon Landing My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. As always, there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates SpaceX, as always, is very busy in Boca Chica. A lot has happened since the last episode and we're rapidly closing in on static fires and later the inaugural flight. A first indicator that this would be a special day was given on Tuesday morning. Anyone who follows the Mark 1 Starship closely will instantly see that there is something very different in this picture. Can you spot it? Right. The manhole is closed. Either SpaceX was denying holiday leave or there was no one inside anymore. And this hasn't happened, well, ever. My prediction from the last episode was wrong and SpaceX indeed did attempt to put a check mark behind another very important milestone. SpaceX has pressure tested the main tanks of the tank section and guess who was standing in the middle of the dunes amongst crickets to film this awesome piece of technology come to life for the first time ever? Mary. So everyone show some love in the comments for this above and beyond kind of dedication. And while you're at it, go check out NASA Spaceflight's YouTube channel, link is in the description. On Tuesday afternoon, SpaceX used the closure date for that very important milestone on the way to the inaugural flight. The road was closed at the set time and the launch site was cleared. Then SpaceX began pumping nitrogen, an inert gas that cannot ignite, into the two main tanks of the lower half of Starship sitting on the launch mount. If this test was passed without problems, it would mean that the build was stable and that everything could continue as planned. The only visible indicators of the whole process were two plumes of white vapor coming out of the tank section in a very controlled manner. One bigger one just above the lower fins and one smaller, almost not visible one on top. And on both of them it is pretty easy to locate the origin. The bigger vapor cloud came from here, that is the new venting port described in the last episode. These ports are specifically for propellant that is boiling off. This is a normal process and every rocket needs to prevent the tanks from rupturing. As cryogenic propellant filled into the tank starts heating up immediately and turns into gas in the process, these vents act as a pressure relief system keeping pressure inside the tank stable. So this vent worked properly and most likely was used to release pressure after the test. The second, much smaller cloud came from the top. Most likely this vent was the location. Again, a normal venting exhaust supposed to do exactly that. So far so good. From afar everything looked good. No sudden decompression, no hull section rupturing, Starship is still in one piece. A few hours later though, after sunset, while the crew was already working on the pad again, they started spraying some sort of white liquid onto the tank section. Large quantities were applied with what seems to be a hose. There's a lot of speculation going on right now and there is no official news yet, but one of the possible reasons for this could be leak finding. SpaceX could have left a safe amount of pressure in the tanks. Workers then would have applied liquid on the outside to see where the bubbles appear. Another valid explanation could be that it was some sort of sealing agent applied to the hull to get rid of some tiny leakages. So it would still mean that the tanks were able to withstand the first test, but that the tanks would not be completely tight. Yesterday then, SpaceX continued the testing. It was the same procedure as the day before, with the exception that this time SpaceX would try to get the pressure up to the max to see if the tank structure could withstand the needed values. Nitrogen was filled in again and it soon became apparent even from just observing it that this time the pressure inside the tanks was much higher than on Tuesday's event. The dents in the hull, typical for Mark 1, were completely gone. Ice was building up on the outside. The venting ports closed. Everything was set to drive the pressure more and more. Then something happened that classifies as a good old RUD. A rapidly unscheduled disassembly. The pressure buildup inside the tanks was passing the tolerable levels for Mark 1. In a pretty epic event, Mark 1 got rid of its upper bulkhead and at least the first ring segment. In fact, in the frame by frame analysis, it looks like the rupture occurred on the weld between the upper ring segment and the rest of the tank section. Right before the rupture, we can also see liquid nitrogen pouring out at the top. Now the question everyone will be asking is how and why did this happen? And you're on the right channel for the answer. Elon Musk as well as SpaceX have already released statements. 
Let me just read this statement to you. The purpose of today's test was to pressurize systems to the max so the outcome was not completely unexpected. There were no injuries nor is this a serious setback. As Elon tweeted, Mark 1 served as a valuable manufacturing pathfinder but flight design is quite different. The decision had already been made to not fly this test article and the team is focused on the Mark III builds which are designed for orbit. Elon confirmed this on Twitter as well. As it seems, SpaceX had already made the decision to not use Mark I for any test flight activity. Recent investigations must have led them to believe that this prototype would not be flight worthy. So now the plan is to not fix Mark I but instead move to Mark III designs. What does this mean for us? First of all, this means that we'll not witness a flight test this year. My predictions here would be that we will at least have to wait another 3-4 to four months before another prototype will be sitting on the launch mount the same way that Mark 1 already did. It also means that Boca Chica might not be the location for a first test flight. Coco has a pretty far advanced prototype, Mark 2. Elon states in his tweet that they will advance onwards to Mark 3. This either means that Mark II will never fly either or that Mark III will be the first to fly in Boca Chica and that Mark II could be the next candidate for the inaugural flight now. Musk and SpaceX also stated that the flight design differs from what Mark I showed. So pretty much as soon as we see a significant change to Mark I that could be an indicator. Nonetheless, this event shows how very necessary a prototype phase is when it comes to completely new approaches. SpaceX will learn from it and continue differently. What this means for us is that we can be very excited about the next few months even though they most likely will not involve any flight activity. We will see much more construction going on and we'll see what those quite different designs are. So one thing is for sure. Boring is the least appropriate word to describe the Starship prototype phase. Did you like today's update on the most unusual rocket ever built? Then hit the like button and if you haven't done it yet, subscribe to the channel to receive updates on every single episode. It just takes a moment and it helps a lot. Thank you. Starship for moon landing. It is hard to imagine what kind of possibilities Starship will offer us for our future in space. Its payload capabilities and most importantly its price tags are aspects that are first of all hard to believe and secondly are hard to put into any order against anything that is being built right now. Wynne Shotwell as well as other SpaceX officials have stated numerous times that SpaceX intends to land one of the Starships on the surface of the moon in the year 2022. So within two years of development from now, SpaceX is not only planning to have the Starship ready for operation in LEO, they are planning to have it land on another celestial body. As you can see in this latest rendering, which by the way we first saw in Paul Wooster's recent presentation at the Mars Society Conference 2019, SpaceX is not planning to send just a small rover or some sort of small science instrumentation. They are simply planning to send the largest lander ever made. Even without refueling in orbit, Starship will be capable of a substantial payload delivery and a return mission to the moon and back. On Monday, November 18th, NASA did the only logical thing. They announced more private partners for a partnership for the Artemis program. To be precise, for the commercial lunar payload services. Now do not get me wrong here. Thomas Zurbucher, Associate Administrator for Science at NASA explicitly stated that they are just seeking help to enable the American nation to send the next humans to the moon. NASA is talking about payload here, not a crude flight. They still want SLS to do this, but this nonetheless is a step into the right direction. These five companies are Blue Origin, Ceres Robotics, Sierra Nevada Corporation, Tyvek Nano Satellite Systems Incorporated and SpaceX. The program is supposed to start delivering payload to the moon beginning in 2021 and there are multiple different payloads qualifying for a mission. Blue Origin will send its Blue Moon Lander, a traditional lunar lander which they have been working on for several years now. Ceres Robotics is planning to send landers and rovers to the lunar surface as well. SNC will send a robotic spacecraft that will deliver a variety of small and large experiments, supplies and equipment to the moon. Tyvek will send what looks to be a very small lunar lander most likely for scientific reasons to scout a possible landing site for Artemis for example. SpaceX COO Gwynne Shotwell announced that SpaceX will deliver science, technology and cargo to the lunar surface. 
She explicitly did not say anything about a crewed flight to the surface though. As stated before, NASA is still planning on using SLS for this. This could change though if SpaceX can demonstrate a landing on the moon without any trouble. This timeline as we're used to with SpaceX is very ambitious. Getting from a Mark 1 prototype to a fully developed Starship that not only is capable of reaching orbit and returning but is also landing on the lunar surface in under 3 years from now would be absolutely incredible. Compare Starship to the other contributors to the commercial lunar payload service. We have small landers, even smaller landers and landers that do not even exist yet. And we have Starship. A 200 ton stainless steel monster and a giant super heavy booster capable of landing payload on the moon and returning to earth. And all this for the price of the propellant and operational costs. Nothing is wasted. A Starship could do this trip probably every two weeks, delivering a small base ahead of Artemis for the astronauts to have a warm cup of coffee as soon as they arrive on their little lander. To be honest, all this looks a bit bizarre to me, as if all the other players in the business have not yet realized what they're dealing with. A Starship could deliver all the payloads and missions from the other contributors in a single mission. Whether it makes sense to deliver a lunar lander on a Starship stands to be debated. The landing though, hanging on Starship's cargo crane, would classify as soft. The hardest part is reaching the moon. Returning from the moon is rather easy, as a Starship would only weigh 33 tons on the lunar surface but has thrusters capable of producing 1200 tons of thrust. So it would need 2.75% of its available thrust to lift off from the surface and it would only need to reach an escape velocity of 2.83 km per second. But why is that? If you want to learn about gravity and the universes of consequences that spring from it, check out Brilliant.org. From the fundamental question what is mass to the subtlety of gravitational redshift, Brilliant.org covers all of it or just as much as you want to know. How does the moon create ocean tides and how to predict the thickness of a neutron star's atmosphere just by understanding gravity? What is a gravitational field and why is a planet round? All these questions tie into gravity itself. If you understand the world, you can open the door to the universe. To become a scientific explorer and at the same time support What About It, go to brilliant.org slash whataboutit and sign up for free to get access to their weekly brain teasers and puzzles. And if you choose to get the premium subscription, the first 200 to sign up through the link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. So open doors to other worlds. Find out for yourself how the universe works with brilliant.org. Link is in the description. So this wraps up today's episode of What About It? Why did Starship take a shower and wouldn't it be easier to just put all those other landers into Starship's cargo bay? As always, tell me in the comments. And another episode watched until the end. Well done, thank you very much. And you're still watching even though this is just the patron shout out. So either you're one of my patrons and you want me to say your name in a horrible way or you understand how important they are and you want to see who's new on the team. Either way, patrons are the foundation of What About It and each time it gives me great pleasure to announce the newcomers pushing What About It just that little bit further. So everyone, please give a warm welcome to Rick Thor, Barry Kirk and Kevin A. Van Driel. You rock! Thank you for watching this episode of What About It. If you liked what you saw, remember to hit the like and the subscribe button because that helps the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content. As this gives me the time to focus on what I love doing the most, to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. Rapidly closing in on fires. What? <laughs> no. Haven't not yet, haven't not yet, Danton. Yeah. This could change, it could change. You never know. Yes. Woo!